We immortalize not only primary documents by digitizing them, but we immortalize people's lives. Uh, we make their lives come alive again uh, through uh, investigation. And so we're that area of uh, immortalization where we take common people and make their lives become important. And uh, their lives and their contributions will never die. Uh, we're at that point uh, beyond this immortalization we're also intersection. We're a point of intersection uh, between the local and the state, the national, the world. We're also an intersection between what is truth and what is memory. journal for someone who lived at the time or, or something that was around the time of that specific historical event. It's from the actual time, like let's say you had a guy coming on the Mayflower, it's actually like his diary. Evidence from the history, primary source, like first person account. Primary historical evidence is evidence actually from the time period in which you're studying. Primary historical evidence is all around us. It's in our homes. It's down the street. It is the echo of those who have gone before us. Primary sources help us understand the human factor of times past. Primary evidence helps us recognize change whether we embrace it or reject it. It is the voices of the past that help shape the present, and primary documents are their living history. PrimaryResearch.org recognizes the significance of primary documents and artifacts not just for present use, but also for generations yet to come. The path started in, I believe it was 98. Um, and it really started on a napkin. Um, Dean Eastman and I were at a restaurant and we were just tossing around some ideas about you know, teaching methods um, that he's been using for many years. And, um, and that on the napkin we drew a triangle. And the triangle really had three points. The one of them was the uh, archivists and scholars and uh, people that work in uh, historical institutions. Um, and one point was students. And the other point were teachers and librarians. So we thought of um, coming up with a model that would bring together all of those different people. Um, and the natural um, environment for that would be at the institutions where these scholars and archivists and museum curators worked. We knew that the budget wouldn't take it, so we went out and got a grant to run it as a voluntary program. Uh, Tom Scully, the public librarian uh, at, uh, in, in Beverly, was kind enough to offer us his facility. Uh, he became one of the three teachers. It was Tom Scully and Kevin McGrath and I. And we began to run the program um, in the spring um, on Saturday mornings and at the public library before school at 7. Our purpose is to try to get students to learn how to do real research by using real resources, not by put, put, taking out an encyclopedia or, or going to a textbook. But, going to the original sources, going to the museums, the archives, the libraries that house these things, learn how to take the information, make their own evaluation of the facts, draw their own conclusions, um, instead of just getting something that's spoon-fed by somebody else. A lot of the idea behind PATH has to do with documents and, the, and also the research that students have um, completed using those documents. A lot of times students are creating databases of information based on what they found. Um, like if there's a Civil War database um, that they created. So a lot of these things we want to share um, with the, you know, the research community. Our first year of PATH we got a grant from the Massachusetts Historical Records Advisory Board to fund the first year of the program and part of what we were supposed to do under the grant was to make 
whatever we did available to other people to be a model for doing this in other school systems. So primaryresearch.org started out as the way to make this available to other people. We were looking for uh, some type of vehicle where uh, students could see their own work and we could also create uh, building stones for other researchers uh, to uh, help them uh, for whatever areas of uh, Beverly research or the history of the North Shore. The website is a great way of um, you know, sharing information, uh, whether it be digitized documents or the actual research that students have completed. Um, so it's basically a publishing tool for the results of the, of the program. The advantage of primaryresearch.org is that it gives students a context in which to work with historical artifacts and documents. Students are working in real time to solve historical mysteries that bring to light forgotten aspects of the past. Mm -hmm. To work on a project that is represented on primaryresearch.org, uh, students have to become intellectual decathletes because you have to know a lot of different skills with history. You have to know uh, where to find many documents and what those documents can tell you. I learned how to rely on myself and rely on um, the documents and that helped, that helped a lot. The most important skill I learned was how to conduct primary research. Beyond that I learned how to organize um, a really well written paper and organize my thoughts to make it come out in the best way possible. I definitely got a lot better at reading primary documents there. You would be surprised at how difficult it is to read someone's handwriting on paper that's over a hundred years old. College professors like it when you use primary documents on your papers. And some of my history professors won't take a paper if you don't have primary documents on it. So learning how to analyze primary documents, that's, that's, that's been big. What we try to do is have a collaboration circle. Um, you have scholars and you have archival uh, resources and you have teachers and students and we're all interrelated. We all need each other and one feeds off and we can't be successful. So in this local history course we try to keep some ideas in mind. One is collaboration. Uh, we are not just monadnocks, you know, we are not unconnected mountains. Uh, we have to be connected. Part of the reason for our success, uh, a big part of it, is the people we've met in other institutions. We were taking our students to a lot of places where the actual materials are. Um, Peabody Essex Museum, uh, Harvard, uh, Massachusetts Historical Society, uh, Massachusetts Archives and things like that. And as we went to these places and we asked them to participate, we sort of did get a network put together. The Gutman Library at Harvard University offers the students a unique experience. Here they get to work closely with special collections librarian Marilyn Altieri. Bureau of Education circulars as well as, you know, pamphlet material on various training programs and things. So, you know, there was an awful lot going on in this time period in the field of vocational and, and trade education. Even here at Harvard, there were people on the faculty here in really? the very early days of the Harvard Ed School in 1920 who were extremely interested in vocation. Not only do the students have access to a vast collection of documents, Mary Len ensures the students get the materials required to complete their projects. She then takes them into the Climate Controlled Special Collections Archive to find more valuable resources for them to use in their research. All materials in the Gutman Library are available to the students. Once they find the materials they are looking for, they are ready for the next stage in their research. During their visit to the library, the students spend several hours handling, analyzing, and recording useful information. This collaboration effort has not only been a fantastic learning experience for the students, it has also created a research network that is essential for primaryresearch.org's future projects.
my part in the primaryresearch.org was to make a uh, database with approximately six areas, fields, that would describe the uh, setting of the uh, educational archives at the uh, Beverly High School. When I entered the high school, they were still doing a lot of the digitization of um, various uh, papers and uh, so on, and I have the feeling that they were kind of in the beginning stages of that, although they already, already had done quite a bit. When I arrived at the Beverly High School, um, the new room that had been constructed was um, still a tiny bit messy <laughs> and, uh, and a type of uh, database had been created by uh, some students or to kind of get a handle on what was in the room and it was uh, kind of cumbersome and it wasn't really usable. It wasn't the right thing. So my uh, purpose and what I did was to work on the room and surveyed it and um, every shelf, every nook and um, made a, created a new uh, database using uh, various fields for example, the location of the room, the type of document, the date of the document, the uh, what it entailed, the scope, and uh, and also if it uh, needed some help as far as if it was fragile, tearing, and so on. The database helps you to bring all the things together, no matter really where they are. privilege to live in an area where there's a lot of history um, compared to the rest of the country. Um, so there's a lot of topics that we can choose from that go way back. The projects basically, uh, Kevin and Tom Scully and I get together uh, for, for PATH projects and we say what are we going to do this year? And various ideas come up and we throw them around uh, and that's how we do it. Topics present themselves um, uh, sort of serendipitously, we just hear about something um, and we think that, wow, it's something that we have a rich history of in Beverly. No one's really talked about it too much. Um, we try to focus on things that students would be interested in and that not many people have done before. Tiptoeing through the tombstones is one database that is featured on primaryresearch.org. Dean and his students have spent extensive time in local graveyards to gain an understanding of colonial gravestones. Prior to the students' entrance into the graveyard, Dean gives them seriation charts to fill out as they examine the stones. Before he sets them loose, he gives them background information essential to conducting their research. Uh, the Puritans were much similar to Old Testament Jews in their beliefs. They were the chosen people. They were sent out into the wilderness. Uh, the whole world was looking at them. Uh, God had chosen them, etc. And uh, they believed in, uh, at some point in time, um, God was going to fight the devil and there would be that big apocalypse. And then 144,000 people would be saved. So it was predestined that 144,000 people would be saved and uh, they would all rise from the dead. After the brief lecture, Dean is finally ready to take the students into the cemetery. He does, however, take a few moments to explain some of the defining attributes of Puritan gravestones. Why do you think there's these marks here? Wherever form and function are always related. What do you think these marks here? This is a cherub. You can see it has wings, it's kind of a fat face. It's called the lunette. That's where you're gonna see the death head or the cherub or the urinal willow. Now in this case you don't, which I'll explain later. And then the other part, this corner up here is called uh, the finial. And this area down here is called the border. It's in memory of, so you just put whatever it says. And then uh, 
put down underneath for the date. You know, if it's a death head, you just put the date in. The, the students are now ready to conduct their research. This is a, a box that we put donations in. Um, we've gotten donations over the last year from the archives. And uh, whenever we get anything, we just put it in this box. So when we get a chance to sort through this, uh, the first thing we want to look at. After the artifacts are collected, the students must then sort through each box to see what they contain. Yeah, yeah, we have a box. As the students scour the documents, they often have questions as to where each piece fits in. VHS News. So does it have things about World War II in there? I'll like check. a victory club or anything like that? Um, hmm. I mean, the club, there's the Junior Red Cross. Oh, okay. Kevin McGrath answers the questions to the best of his ability. Often, the students happen upon a piece of unique history. This is really rare. We we're actually hoping to get more of these. One of the students has found a paper from World War II. Here's a picture of... Um, Kevin takes a couple of minutes to explain the significance of the find and its impact on local history. Put a lot of ads in there. The ads themselves are really interesting. Here's an Kevin ad for, finds um, an interesting poem a student wrote Yard. about a Jeep oh, yeah, and proceeds Force. to read it to the group of students. The Jeep is a marvelous critter. The Jeep is a wonderful thing. The Jeep, it never, it's never a quitter. We're happy its praises to sing. Buy jeeps, oh buy jeeps, and thousands of jeeps over the sea, the sea. Buy jeeps, buy more jeeps, they'll bring back my soldier to me. Sort of like this wow. this is an old leather. The students must restore artifacts and documents that need it. Kevin sits down with them and explains the process yeah, and the tools thing. that professional archivists so use like to restore a, artifacts. It's just a really uh, mild eraser. Mm -hmm. you can, if you rub it, it's got like a, some stuff that comes out. Oh, yeah. It's almost like abrasive stuff. Yep. So if you rub it over the top, it'll take off some of the... At this point, Kevin explains the final process like in this book's restoration. Yeah. Just take some of one of these here. It's the purpose of this is to clean off leather book covers, part okay. of a red rot. Red rot's just this kind of mold that gets on the, oh, really? the weird, it's got a kind of weird consistency to it. But this is called cellugel. Yeah, it takes a little while to dry, but it, it, it restores the uh, leather back to the, so it looks like so, sort of state. like its original state. Yeah, it's kind of like when you... It is now time you know, for the student to take over and complete the book's restoration. After approximately five minutes of delicate work, the book is now ready to go into the archive. Kevin now takes some time to explain to this student how to restore the most delicate of documents. Acid, it's good for acid-free paper. It doesn't uh, turn yellow. The thing about folding paper, though, you always want to have paper flat. Um, when you get newspapers, they're almost always folded. But the more they're folded, the more likely it is to break the paper. Um, once we flatten it out um, with the book, you know, we have a flat surface here we can work with. We take this um, thermoplast and just put it over the cracked part of the paper and where it's ripped or about to rip. I'll just preserve the, uh, at least hold it together. Let's do it along the seam there. Get try to get these two connected down there.
Kevin explains to the students why it is necessary to restore newspapers more than other documents. But newspapers are some of the worst paper for lasting a long time. So, so thin, so thin. Yeah. It's made with like really low grade paper, which has a lot of acid in it. Oh, so it just deteriorates? So it turns yellow. That's why paper turns yellow so fast. Mm -hmm. um, and during the war, they had the worst paper because they were trying to save money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, if you look at the aegises, the aegises I think are smaller. From yeah, they didn't have enough money for printing. So it's unusual to see stuff printed, books printed during the war. It's probably the fewest amount of books printed during the war oh, in really? general. Yeah. The final stage in this process is to put the documents in a format that can be accessed by the public on the computer. The students work with hundreds of documents. In many cases, they have to retype the information by hand into the computer. This requires them to learn such skills as typing, understanding databases, and other essential computer skills. It is not uncommon to walk into Beverly High School on any given day and see students importing data and scanning pictures to ensure the public will have full access to the materials. The process can often be tedious and time consuming. Yet through dedication and hard work, the students keep the information going into the database. The students really get a sense of history as they work with the artifacts. I'm working on a project where we're cataloging all of the, the clubs and groups and sports teams that they ever had at Beverly High School. And uh, to do so I have to look through the yearbooks, which are, there are some back there. And um, these are the beehives and they're basically the handbook that students got at the beginning of each year. And you can see the clubs and they're explained. I worked on the relationship between poverty and crime in black antebellum Boston. I was trying to find the relationship between poverty and crime to prove that the blacks, although it was stereotypical that they were the ones creating a lot of the poverty and crime in the area, uh, I, I set out to prove that that was not true. I did my project on um, American high schools and their involvement on the home fronts in both major world wars. The project I worked on was about the African Americans' reaction to the Fugitive Slave Law in the 1850s, and I did most of my research on the neighborhood and community of Beacon Hill and the voluntary associations that were formed as a response to the Fugitive Slave Law. I used a lot of newspapers. I used the reports of the Prison Discipline Society to gather the figures um, about who was in the jail at the time. Uh, I used uh, the Liberator articles to find articles about temperance movements and all types of things for reform, moral reform. My favorites were probably the Liberator uh, articles because they were the most helpful. They helped really secure my paper and bring it together in the end. What I found most interesting was how many people were involved. It wasn't just like a few individuals, it was a whole school effort, like everyone was involved with the war effort. Um, I mean, you looked at the senior pictures and you read the afterwards, everyone had at least one major club that was involved in um, either being making surgical dressings or training um, military drill on the baseball team for the boys, once they went over, they could um, they would know a little more, or um, the students who collected the war bonds. And I mean, the war was an everyday part of the school day. It was everywhere. It was in the student bulletins. It was in the student literary magazine. It that just baffled me on how involved everyone was. I use a lot of different primary documents in my paper. Most of them or a lot of them were advertisements from local papers like the Liberator. Some of them were just records from the different associations. The most important and influential piece of or primary document that I used was the Treasury Book from Francis Jackson. 
And that was really important because it showed all the money that was going through the uh, association and all that actually had all the names of the people that they either sent to Canada or set up with homes and gave money to and assistance to in Boston. So you could tell fugitives that they helped that later became members of the association and it had a lot of really good details and a lot of information. The most fascinating part about the research was transcribing documents that were handwritten. Uh, it was a lot of fun going through with a magnifying glass trying to decipher what the words were because they were written in script so it was tough but it was a lot of fun. There were a couple really touching poems. One was called Gold Star Mother and it was about how this student's walking down the street or someone's walking down the street and um, they noticed that the blue star was replaced for a gold star and that meant the soldier died and that was touching. And it was just the whole aspect of how everyone was so involved like really hit me too. It was amazing how much people were involved back then. So. My findings were that the stereotypes were completely false. Um, the number of African Americans in the jails or who were poverty stricken did not compare um, with each other. The majority were, were whites um, in the lower class, uh, but for the most part, the stereotypes were, were false. The community could use my research if they wanted to find those sort of unknown people that were really involved in the fugitive slave law. Um, all the, yeah, all the people that have been forgotten or didn't get any recognition, especially the women that weren't recognized at all really, there, I found a lot of them through my research. I think the quality of the work is excellent. Um, what, the, what they have done is so impressive in, in so many ways. I think that um, one, of the, one of the qualities that they bring to all their research is empathy. Uh, I think that uh, the, the uh, uh, discovery that historical records are about real people and real individuals, people whose names they get to know, people who owned property in their community, who lived and died and brought their kids up there and had jobs and um, were really um, real people. Is, is a key to that and uh, I can sense that the students have a tremendous empathy with the people they are studying. We see students here at Harvard who have never touched a primary resource. I've had graduate students come in here and have to be taught the, what is the difference between a primary source and a secondary source and that's not ever going to happen with Dean and Kevin students. They, they know that already and they know how uh, the primary sources open a window into the lives of people. There are so many different aspects to this work that are really at a, at a very high level and uh, would compare very favorably with, with um, work that I've seen coming out of university level courses. So I definitely think it's, a, it's of a very high quality. And um, I've referred many people to it and have had a lot of very positive comments back from those people too. So I, I don't think I'm the only one who sees it that way. I think the level is very much um, advanced. That's the way my assessment would be, especially since they have the opportunity to work with the uh, Harvard Education uh, Library and just the opportunities there for dialogue and um, I feel it would definitely be advanced. It's really great to see these kids um, using this material, getting face to face with the 19th century or the 18th century, getting face to face with the past and seeing their own connection to it. It's really a wonderful thing and it's an inspiring thing to be able to bring history to them and then they, through their work, really bring history to life. The papers these kids have written are really terrific works of scholarship based on primary research. Well, we signed a contract to at least keep our name for the next nine years, so we know they're going to be around for, for nine. Uh, who knows? I mean, you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, right now, we have a vehicle that we can keep on expanding and expanding with what we have. 
but every year some new idea comes across and uh, it takes over and we add that as part of it. Um, we're toying with the idea of studying New England stone walls this idea and this year and the building of New England stone walls. Um, we have somebody who's sort of an expert on that subject. Um, we're looking at some old tumble down stone walls in Green Hills Park in North in uh, Rouse Side and we're thinking about going over there and using that as a sort of lab, have this expert come in and show students how walls are put together, why people built stone walls in colonial times. Um, and there's some old photographs that now Greens Hill is completely overgrown and forested. There were photographs we have from 100 years ago that showed this wide open pasture with stone walls all over the place. So I think that will be kind of fun. As far as the future, I think that we'd like to just keep growing with um, putting large amounts of local primary documents online. Uh, we feel that like local history is owned by the, the local community. That's not uh, it shouldn't be something that's owned by a particular institution. Um, it should be under the umbrella of an institution to take care of these documents, but it's part of, um, um, for many of these documents, part of the, it should be part of the mission of institutions that have them to make them uh, the public aware of what they have and also to make them accessible to the public. So uh, part of our, our mission is to um, promote the availability of local resources and to make them actually available on the website.